एवरीवन, आई एम अरुण रंगनाथन डूइंग मास्टर्स इन इंजीनियरिंग मैनेजमेंट एट एनसी स्टेट वेलकम बैक टू द अनदर एपिसोड टुडे आई एम सो एक्साइटेड टू इनवाइट डॉक्टर माइकल स्पैनो व्हो हैज वेरी मच ऑफ एन एक्सपीरियंस व्हिच आई कांट वेट टू टेक इन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर एक्सेप्टिंग आवर इनवाइट एंड बीइंग हियर विद अस टुडे आई कुडंट रेजिस्ट या दैट इज वन ऑफ इट एंड या आई स्ट्रांगली बिलीव दिस सेशन विल बी वेरी एनर्जेटिक एज वी नो यू आर सच अ पॉजिटिव पर्सन एंड वी वांट टू गेट मोर आउट ऑफ यू because we just know a little bit of you and we want to know everything sure. you have for us so yeah you are a program director you were perf- uh, selected on a cto cio uh, you were in ibm for the past 30 years or something so how did you get involved in tech can you tell more about us well i'm going to have to go way back to really start the story um when i was a small child i would get a toy receive a toy the first thing i would do with that toy is take it apart and then i learned from that to be curious go to put it back together it wouldn't go back together so you learn to fail my father would never actually scold me for putting something back together wrong or not putting it back together so having a mentor someone who lets you fail was probably how i got into the tech world is not being afraid to fail so be curious no don't be afraid to fail have someone who lets you fail um i wasn't actually in the tech field to start i started out as a carpenter and a mason using my hands very kinesthetic um not very mental and my father being an engineer just kept pushing me and pushing me and he was patient and I finally decided to go to um school unfortunately my high school grades were not that good so I couldn't get into a big university so I went to a small community college brought my grades up and then went to NIT and got my engineering degree that's why I got into the tech field we call it tech field but really the manufacturing field way back then and then we started manufacturing in IBM Biomedical a small business unit and I was a manufacturing engineer and we were getting designs from development engineers we couldn't manufacture um so I called meetings I was very stubborn and finally convinced them to switch roles we we called it walk a mile in my shoes so the development engineers came to manufacturing the manufacturing engineers went to development we learned each other's jobs so we made better products and so then I was hooked So that's how I really got into the tech field, but my really my roots really go back to manufacturing. And then during manufacturing of biomedical equipment, we started sending um EKG signals, heart signals over phone lines like a fax machine. And we got approached by a small business unit called IBM Personal Computers and said, "Why don't you put our computer into your medical equipment?" So we did that. And then I was hooked on the digital, if you will, part of the world. And so that was my real move into the tech, if you will, industry. I'm um Our medical got sold because we had a blood cell disorder discovered in the 80s that caused us to get out of that business. Joined PC company manufacturing in Raleigh. Um and as you've heard me say many times, life is like happens in three acts. You know, you have your first act in which you overcome an obstacle. You have your middle act in which you stumble again and and more obstacles and it looks like you're going to fail and you have your third act in which you succeed. So after coming through the biomedical story I got in PC company and within a year in in PC company we had another obstacle we lost most of our executives in a plane crash. So again, mid mid act we have to reconvene and we reorganized and we made PC company into the profitable division. But from then on I was hooked into the IT world. From the IT world I learned that basically IT's whole job, tech's whole job is to move data. And so I was just fell in love with data back in the 90s and uh it's been a love a love ever since i love data so that's how i got into the tech industry it's a long story many jobs along the way as you indicated so yes. lots of manufacturing roles and then advanced manufacturing was sort of where manufacturing and it meet and then i went into it roles cio cto program director etc and just loved it but i like to quote robert frost um you've always heard the path not taken and he talks about two paths in the yellow wood sorry i can only take one well i proved robert frost wrong 30 years ago when i started teaching and working at the same time yes. so i took both paths and i was just in love with teaching because it allowed me to become part of your stories each of your stories yeah i'm somewhere in that three act play of your life yes i hope i'm not the obstacle <laughs> no definitely so, not yeah i hope I'll, that answers your question yeah how do you think your uh, experience in tech world or the industry like influence your teaching and research great question it's really a great question it's difficult to answer but yet simple to answer at the same time 
it affects me because I've been out there yeah. where you're heading. Yes. You're heading to the world I come from. And so having that experience out there, actually 42 and a half years experience out there, I've already bruised my knuckles, got in the scars, and know what the journey you're about to embark on. So by coming back and teaching you, becoming part of your story, I've become that father in my story. Yeah. Hopefully the person there, so when you fail, that will learn together on what you learn from that failure. You're gonna find that through your journeys, you will learn more from your failures than you will for your successes. Yes. You will remember your failures longer than you'll remember your successes. So I, I hope that my teaching lets you fail, if you will, with bumpers so that you have the ability to have a plan A, plan B, plan C. And that we talk about all aspects of it. We talk about the tech, we talk about the data, we talk about the people part of it, the soft skills. Yeah. So that's where I think my real world, if you will, experience is into teaching. But teaching is one of those things that um, you have to really love. Yes. Um, and if you don't love it, it comes across in what you do, I mean, in anything. If you don't love what you're doing, change what you're doing. And so that's exactly why I'm now full-time. I loved what I was doing part-time. I had the opportunity, thanks to Dr. Swan, to come full-time, and I jumped at that. I didn't even think twice. Um, there were lots of other things I could have done, but this is the only thing I want to do, yes. as long as I can do it. Because I meet wonderful students like you. Uh, you've traveled far on your journey, yeah. and you're just at the beginning of your journey. So Yeah. Yeah. You have mentioned about your failures now. So what are the failures like you faced throughout your uh, life? Well, How did you overcome it? Probably my worst failure was was in Y two K. I was instructed to use a specific ERP system that I couldn't use because the timing and the costs were just not in line. Yeah. And so, as far as the board was concerned, I failed because I didn't do what they wanted me to do. But as far as I was concerned, I succeeded in the fact that the company didn't shut down during Y two K. We were able to keep our business going. And then later on, we did what the comp what the company wanted it. So it was a two step. So the failure was not accomplishing it in one step. But having a plan B, I was able to do it in two steps. So okay. um, probably other failures on, along the way would be not getting as much done in K-12 as I hope to do as a CIO and a CTO. Mm -hmm. um, but working for state government is not easy. Nothing happens fast. Yeah. And so that's kind of a failure on my part is I thought I could change state government, but I couldn't. But in hindsight, it's not my failure. Yes. So, but I learned a lot. Yeah. So again, yes. Any failure, I encourage you, is immediately after the failure, sit down and figure out what went right, what went wrong, and what you would do differently again. You know, Band-Aid, put Band-Aids on all the cuts you got from that failure, but then move on. Yes. My garage is full of failures I've started and stopped and on building things. But, yeah, that's true. So when you worked with state government, as you said now, like what are the like, changes you wanted to bring? You wanted to make some impact. Sure. That's why you left your job and went to the state government. and But you couldn't, or... Uh, you couldn't do it or you wanted something. Right. Like so one of the things I had hoped to do was more digitiz digitization. Mm -hmm. um, most government agencies still run on paper. In fact, if you walk around this building and look yeah. on people's desks, you see lots of paper. Yes. Right. Well, state government, it's more paper. Federal government, even more paper. So my goal was to move more away from paper, more into digitization. And so it was hard to accomplish. Change is very difficult. Uh, organizational change, lots of books written on it lots of consulting engagements on it. The problem comes down to the people. The people do not want to change. They're comfortable with the paper. They know how paper works and how it feels. They can literally pick it up and put their arms around it. Ones and zeros, digital bits, they cannot do that with. And yes. so they feel like it's out of their control once it's into the digital landscape. So that was, digitization is challenging for many, many yeah. companies. In fact, um, we probably could stand a digitization program here. Mm -hmm. um, we've moved to podcasts over, I don't know what we had before these, but podcasts is a step in the right direction. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that answers uh, my failure question and what I would like to change in government. <laughs> yeah. We weren't going to talk about politics, but there's <laughs> yeah. lots of other things I'd like to change, but digitization, let's leave it at that. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about your startup. So you had sure. a startup of uh, Indometers and Atlas Consulting. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. That is a very nice name. I was finding it. It's like untamed to be. I a duck. Yeah. Wild duck. How did it come from? Sure. Well, early in my career, not as far back as a child, but early in my career with IBM, uh -huh. I was in management training. One of the nice things about being an IBM, a large corporation, is they invested in their managers, their leaders. Yeah. Every year I had to take one week local and one week at corporate. So two weeks training every year mm -hmm. to stay as a leader in IBM back in the day. I was up in Armonk. 
and part of your training is physical activity. So you have to run, exercise, walk. So I was walking through IBM corporate headquarters, standing there in an office behind a stand-up desk. But this is not the stand-up desks we have today. This is a giant wooden desk that was made to be standing. Yeah. It was a very elderly gentleman. Behind him was a poster of a wild duck. And it said, we at IBM encourage wild ducks. What a wild duck is by definition is it's a duck that doesn't fly in formation. Mm -hmm. So you always hear the story about a flock of ducks flying and they rotate their leaders. The leader goes to the back and someone takes over. Well, that's great if everybody knows where they're going. Yeah. If there's a storm ahead and no one knows that, they fly into a storm. The wild duck is the person, the duck, if you will, that stays outside of that formation yeah. and tries the things and fails at the things that the other ducks don't do. And so the ones that actually bruise their knuckles, get the scars. And so I really liked that poster. So I started talking to the elderly gentleman and found out that he was the grandson of Thomas Watson. Oh. We had founded IBM. By the time I returned to Raleigh, there was a copy of that poster in my mail from him. And it still hangs in my office at home okay. today. And so when I had a chance to start my consulting firm in between companies, um, I had taken a five-year leave of absence from IBM to mm -hmm. become a CIO at Siemens. Okay, yeah. And I was done there in four years. Yeah. So I had a year before I could come back. Yeah. And so I took that year to start my own consulting firm. And I thought, well, duck, why not? And so Adonis, whatever, IA is what I called it, is Wild Duck. Mm -hmm. And so I named my company that. And I started doing consulting engagements on mm -hmm. my own. Great experience. I highly, if you're independently wealthy, go do it. The hardest part about being a consultant on your own is getting paid. Yes. Because companies are like, yeah, well, what are they going to do? Assuming it's one person. So being a big consulting firm like IBM or KPMG, et cetera, you've got a finance department behind you to get you paid. Yeah. And so I learned a lot. Um, the good thing about that is I didn't have a methodology, mm -hmm. a formal methodology from the company. Um, I could do what I want. I didn't have to sell product. So being an independent consultant really was a great. I had two or three gigs before I returned to IBM. And one of those was an interim CIO role. And that's when I really got hooked on being a CIO. And so I always sought after that to become a CIO and then a CTO. They're slightly yes. different. Some companies, a CTO is really a CIO and some companies, a CIO is really a CTO. Yeah. One focuses on the data, if you will. Mm -hmm. And actually some companies have a CDO, Chief Data Officer. Yes. So CIO tends to focus on the data and a CTO tends to focus on the equipment, yeah. if you will, the lower levels of the infrastructure. So yes, that was uh, quite the uh, eye-opening experience. Uh, what was the major setbacks you found throughout the just getting uh, just getting paid honestly I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, literally I had a company not pay me they owed me 55 yeah. grand and it was an AI company that was doing AI dosing for AIDS patients mm -hmm. didn't pay me and then their company folded and they wanted me to come extract their AI from their product so that they can sell that separately but I didn't do it because they wouldn't pay me mm -hmm. they said well we'll pay you you know X dollars more if you come back and I'm like pay me the other dollars first. So getting paid as an independent consultant is very difficult. Yeah. So, but the consulting's fun and not having a, a methodology is not a good thing, but it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Not having a team of thousand people that you can call on mm -hmm. to get more expertise is nice. Yeah. Um, and it requires a broader set of shoulders. You have to have more background to be on your own than within a company. That's true. Yeah. So what made you run till now? Like I saw your resume, it was like seven pages of just your experience. I was like, God, you have been like acting CIO, CEO, all of the organizations. So what made you run? And you're not retired still. You're as a professor, full-time professor here. I will never retire. Yeah. I will work until I can't work. But um, what drives me again is to be part, uh, it sounds so corny, but I want to be part of the student's journey. Okay. Um, I've had the pleasure, the absolute pleasure of working with Managing and leading, they're not the same things, by the way. They share many characteristics, but they're two different things. And some days you're a manager, some days you're a leader. But I have worked with some of the most amazing people on the planet. Yeah. Every job I've been in, and I've had a lot of jobs, the people were the most amazing part of that. And to be part of their story, just it's just amazing. I mean, rubbing shoulders of giants, living in the shadow of giants, just and they're not giants yet. They're just seedlings. They're they're new students that are going to become giants. Yeah. And just to look back years later and see all the students and, and employees that I've worked with and mentored do well. I mean, that makes you happy. <laughs> that makes me very happy. Yeah. And um, to, to come here to NC State, which is my alma mater, but mm -hmm. also it's a very prestigious yes. university. It's not, you know, not that other universities would have been just as good. To come back home to the university I got my degrees in, where I invested money at IBM, um, 
built the MC department with uh, Dr. Zorowski. I mean, to come back here and be part of the, the faculty just yeah. is amazing. I mean, to be in the same booth that literally Dr. Ivy yes. sat in is just amazing. I mean, so. Yeah. What is your passion? Like teaching? Teaching or? and uh, I guess teaching and mentoring. Mentoring mm -hmm. is teaching so sometimes are the same, yes. sometimes they're not. Uh, as you know, you've attended my classes. Right? Yes. Sometimes class is just teaching and sometimes class is mentoring. But developing people's potential is probably my passion. You know, mm -hmm. As you know, you hear me talking about my two successful children. Yeah. I mean, that's my life. I mean, now that they're well successful, I need to go find new children to, <laughs> to nurture. And so I look through my student groups and I find those few people like yourself that want to do a little bit more yeah. than just come, sit, take tests and graduate. I want to come for the experience. They want to come to listen. That's my passion. And um, the fact that I get the privilege of doing it is just amazing. And at my age, you know, to be able to teach full time, I get up every morning and it's amazing. Yes. My father once said, you know, if I would offer you a very large sum of money for a day of your life, would you take it? And I'd say, well, of course I would. He said, what if I tell you that very large sum of money for that one day of your life is the last day of your life, what would you say? And the answer to that is no, right? I want another day of life at any cost. So when I get up in the morning, I remember that lesson, is that basically I got up today and I foregoed a large fortune to be here, to get up and be in the game today. Yeah. And so I want to be the best version of myself for that day. Because yes. that's all I have is that day. The day after that's not guaranteed. Yes. In fact, the full day is not guaranteed, but at least you woke up and you're in the game. You want to be the best version of yourself, whether it's the best partner, whether it's the best instructor, whether it's the best citizen that stops and helps someone fix a flat tire, you want to bring the best part of yourself yes. into that day. Because you, you literally foregoed a fortune to be here. And people would pay a fortune for yet another day. Yeah. I mean, the richest people in the world can't buy another day. The poorest people in the world may outlive them. Yeah. And so money has no bearing on your day. But if you look at it as basically, it's a, it's a privilege to get up. It really is a privilege. And as you get older, it becomes more and more clear that privilege becomes less and less guaranteed. And even at your age, I mean, it's it's tough. But when you get up in the morning, give your best self. Bring it all. Yeah. I know it's hard. You studied last night. You worked late last night. Your project's due tomorrow night. Don't worry about what's due tomorrow. Worry about what you do today. Yeah. Plan. Um, I'm a big planner. I take them. I'm an engineer. You'll be engineers. If you probably are undergraduate engineers, you'll be master's degree engineers. We look at things from a systems perspective. Break the system down. You've got a journey. You have to get from here to December for you. You're graduating. There are steps you have to do, classes you have to take, papers you have to write. Break them down and figure out what you have to do today. Don't worry about what to do next week because you've got to get through today. And so yeah. I break things down. I focused on a podcast last night versus rewriting mm -hmm. modules that are due in two weeks, right? But I'll get back to those. Sometimes you get overwhelmed. You say, well, I got to finish this before I do that and just prioritize. And you've always heard the, I love the lecture where they talk about big rocks, yeah. medium rocks, small rocks, and sand. If you fill the jar with sand, you can't fit the big rocks, the hard things in your life. Yeah. So focus on the big rocks. Yes. Yeah. It's very lovely. It's like just showing up on our half an hour day. It's very difficult, but yeah, that's what makes it, adds value. How are you so energetic always? Energetic. Great question. Um, I choose not to be tired. I really do. It, it's it's a it's a mindset. Uh, when I leave here, I'm extremely tired. So it's kind of like you bank your tiredness. You just and besides, it's exciting to be here. It's hard not to be energetic. I mean, I'm around future CEOs, CIOs, CTOs, startups. The next billionaire could be in this very booth with me. Yes. And that excites me because I've rubbed shoulders. I've become part of their story. Someday on a stage somewhere, they're going to mention this old crotchety ball professor that taught him a life lesson. Yes. And th that's all that matters to me. So I, and I draw my energy from the students. I do. I really, I'm sorry, but I, being around you energetic students, I just take a little piece of that and add it to me, to me every day. So I'm like an energy vampire. I, yeah. I love your energy. And uh, sometimes I have to get you energized too. Yes. And you've, you've been to my class. Sometimes it's kind of lectury, lectury kind of dull and then we end and then we start talking and get energetic and it, it, that's much more I wish there was a class in just that just sitting down and talking to like professors just talking to them not yes. listening to their lectures although lectures are an important part of education so is learning yeah and not those two things don't always go together 
Learning can happen in lots of ways. We're learning now about each other. Yes. Uh, part of it means letting your guard down. You know, I'm exposing part of myself that most professionals don't yeah. by even doing a podcast, but I trust you. Yes. I trust that in the end, the product will be worth my effort, that you will do a great job, and other students will benefit from it. Maybe even other faculty will benefit from it. Yeah. Maybe somebody on the fence about coming to NC State will come to NC State because it's a great experience. There's lots of great professors like me. As I said, I, I walk in the shadow of giants while this hallway is filled with giants of faculty. I mean, they do great things, write great papers, and just to be on the same page with them, in the same book, sharing office with them is amazing. But the students, your story literally is at its beginning. Yeah. That's I hope you're not in act two, the middle yet. I hope you're at the beginning of your journey. You're, you're running into obstacles, you're overcoming obstacles, but you really haven't found your true self yet. That may not happen to your third or fourth job, and then you get the clicks, and you find your true self, and the rest is history. And I watch from afar. Pretty soon it'll be really far, but I'll still watch. I'll still look over your shoulder to make sure you're succeeding because you got here. You got the ticket to come to NC State, to MEM, to whatever program you're in. Yes. And that was a lot of work. Congratulations. I mean, Thank you. think about it. Think about the obstacles you went through to get to this room. Smile about it. Smile because it happened. You got here. I got here. And that's why I draw my energy. So. Yes, that's so nice. No, we don't coin that phrase, energy vampire. <laughs> That's it. So you have been in IBM for 30 years. So was there any moment like you just wanted to go out of this job, like try new jobs because you were having an hard day at work? Because I had a hard day like that and just just because of that I am here right now. So Great question. Number one, I never wanted to be in IBM. <laughs> it was the 70s, right? Things in the 70s, big corporations were not seen in good light. They mm -hmm. were the man. Right? I did not want to be in IBM. My father again nudged me to interview. In fact, he challenged me that I would not get a job offer from IBM. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed, got the job offer. But I was fortunate enough to get into an independent business unit. Before there were startups and investors, there was things called companies would start independent business units. They were within the bigger company, but they were independent. So I started there. Mm -hmm. And so did I want to change jobs? Sure. But to change jobs in IBM, you literally just pointed and said, I want to be there. There were so many other opportunities within a large corporation like that. For your generation, I don't think that exists anymore. Those very, very large corporations that compete on many, many fronts that are that diversified have gotten to be less and less. Giant corporations are very, very small in yeah. number. I imagine Tata in India probably is one of the companies you can get into and have 25, 30 different jobs and never leave Tata. Those companies are rare. Yes. So yes, I got tired and I left. Um, I left the company one time for five year leaves of absence because I was ready. Um, to get to my next position uh, was not going to happen. Yeah. So my mentor at IBM said, you know what the best thing for you is step outside, move up outside, and then step back in. Right. So I did that. I stepped out, became a CIO, stepped back in, not as a CIO, as something else. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I had done advanced manufacturing, robotics, automation, all the things that we talk about in class. I'd done all that. It's done. What's next? I had nothing next. So I wanted to become a researcher at IBM, to become an IBM fellow. I was a senior technical staff member. There was only one level technically above that was called a fellow. Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore. But to be that, you had to have a PhD. So I stepped out again to NC State, mm -hmm. got my master's and PhD. But while I was out, they changed the rules. So when I stepped back in, there was no longer IBM fellows. There was now IBM distinguished engineers. And so I stepped out, and that was a gamble I took. And it didn't work out from my professional career, but that's when I decided to prove Robert Frost wrong and teach at night with my PhD and work during the day. And that made me even more energetic because I can get my energy from work, and then at night I can get my energy from students. And my night students were basically you guys. People from India came over, they took a class at night, they retired, they had full day of classes or a job, and then they came at six o'clock and yes. sat for three hours, sometimes four hours till 10 p.m. while we lectured and talked. And it was, again, I'd go home at 10 o'clock with more energy than most people have at eight o'clock in the morning, so. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. So how easy do you think now, like for ideations to transform to real time applications? I think it's a lot easier today than it was in mm -hmm. the older days because mm -hmm. there's investors. I think there's a lot of tools available for modeling, for simulating that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to caution you about tools. Tools are good things to use. They're good things to learn. But never forget the theory yeah. behind the tool. Because if you learn the theory, 
the tool doesn't matter. Like, like your Python, Python R, Python, et cetera, Power BI. Those are all great things. They're great tools. It's the theory behind them that you really need to know because the tools will come and go. And there are a lot of tools now. Chat, GPT is going to make things so yes. much easier for all of us. Right? But it's a tool. It's all it is. It's not going to replace your intelligence. It's going to augment it. So learn to use the tools that are given to you, but also learn the theory behind those tools. And what I find is when I'm in the private sector, somebody learns a tool. They're really good at that tool, but they're really not good at the theory. Yeah. And so the problem is, is when the theory changes or it's the wrong theory, they don't know it because they're, they're locked into the tool. So learn the theory behind the tool, also learn the tool. Yeah. We're going to talk mostly in my class about theory of the tools. We'll yes. use the tools a little bit. Um, and you need to get the deep learning of tools, but that's not my, somebody else can take that and do it. Yeah. Not me. I want to talk about the theory behind the tools, how to apply the tools. Um, presentations, for example. I mean, you could use PowerPoint. It's a great tool. But it's not it. Yes. It's just what goes into that PowerPoint that's going to make or break you, the theory behind that. How to use color, how to use shape. You know, how to get your message across. That's all part of it. That's PowerPoint's true. just a tool. Just putting something in PowerPoint's not going to close the deal. You've got to actually know what to put into there and how to use it. That's so true. Yeah. So, um, tell me more about your projects. Like, I know you have created some tools as you were talking about it. So, mm -hmm. what are the tools that you have created and what are the pro patents and the projects you have been doing so far? So my, one of my most favorite non-patent products, because I, the company I worked for did not think it was patentable, was the modular system for manufacturing applications back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So, we designed conveyors that could snap together just move it around, reconfigure it from a C to a U to a line dynamically. All the power, all the signal was unpluggable. But the smart part was in the pallet. So when you put a product on the pallet, you put the bill of materials and you put the routing sequence on that pallet. So you could pick that pallet up, drop it anywhere in the line, and it would figure out where it had to go next. That was one of my favorite patents. Um, so we had a routing patent, uh, many other patents. My proudest moment is probably not a patent, it's probably not a technical achievement. It's the people. I keep mm -hmm. coming back to the people I've managed and led. I mean, my last group I managed at the state, we still talk to each other. Mm -hmm. My group I managed in 1982, we still talk to each other. Yeah. I reach out sometimes to people in the first IBU with me, and we still keep in contact. It's the people. It really is the relationships that you develop. Technology comes and goes. Successes come and go. But the relationships you build will be the things you'll leverage throughout your whole career. And so... I think I would focus on that as my biggest success. Not the patents. I think I have 22 or 23 now. Um, not that. Technical achievements are hanging on my wall. They're cool. But I'd rather remember the time I have with the people that we, I, I can remember specifically. And this is probably going to come off badly. We're sitting in a ver air conditioner room. And we're in our lab. And we're developing something. And we're sitting there. And we're coding, coding, coding. And everybody's in like t-shirts and because it's so hot, the sweat's pouring off us. So I bring a, bring a big, big fan and I got for maintenance that you hook up to a water line. And so it's misting everybody. Yeah. So I brought lunch in, pizza and chips. And so somebody was like four rows back and said, hey, can I have some chips? And I can still remember Wayne's face when I poured the potato chips in the back of the fan. And it just shot potato chip dust over everybody. I remember that. Not the fact that we finished that weekend coding and got the conveyor system ready for the demo. It wasn't that. It was the fun I had with the people doing yes. that. Because in the end, that's what energizes me, is people. Yeah. Technology's cool, but people. Yeah. Chat GPT, cool. How it's going to affect people is more interesting to yeah. me. And I really haven't figured that one out yet. Maybe over the summer I'll take some time and really learn it and see how it could improve education down the road. Because it's going to impact education. Yes. That's true. And whether it improves it, or not is up to us, but it's going to impact us. We have to decide how to use it. Every tool that came along, I'm sure when computers were first introduced, people were like, no, no, we still need to use paper. Yeah. I know I get that with Moodle, just the, the learning environment. If some people like it, some people don't, it's a tool. That's it's not true. important. What's important is what goes into Moodle, not Moodle, not Canvas. It's what goes into that, it's what you put in there. Yeah. And uh, I found that you got an award from the President of the United States. Yes. For the five years. Uh, well, oh, 13 years ago, yeah. I was approached by a guy in New York City who was starting a group to mentor returning veterans. Yes. We had the, the wars that we fight. We had veterans coming back, couldn't find jobs. The reason is, is what they do in a daily, their resume looks totally different than a private resume. Yeah. So his thought was to connect those people with experienced people mm -hmm. like me that would help them write the resume develop the interviewing skills, mm -hmm. and leverage the things that they have. And it was called American Corporate Partners. Mm -hmm. 
And so I had been a mentor there for 13 years until the medical thing sidelined me, um, which was last year. And I was there every year, and I've had 18 soldiers all placed, most of them vice presidents now. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a company of directors, and, and I love every one of them. The relationship I have with them, I learn more from them than they learn from me. Uh, these are amazing people. I mean, hire a veteran. I mean, yeah. They have gone through a lot like you. Traveled far, learned a lot, got up early, stayed up late, learned a lot. The problem was translating that into day to day. Yes. So being a platoon leader, you're a manager, right? Yeah. Taking a hill is finishing a project, right? Yes. So helping them translate that. But that skill is just amazing. And and I see it here, you know, Dr. McConnell. Yeah. I mean, just his whole persona, he's just so calm and so intelligent. I mean, I just love talking to him yes. again, like I love talking to students. Yeah. He's just a, another amazing piece of faculty that we have here at this university. You can just basically walk and knock at any of these doors and you're looking at some of the best minds on the planet. So to be yes. on the same floor with them, <laughs> yay. Yeah, and I know you're writing a book right now. I'm trying, yes. I'm trying. I'm writing actually three or four books. One is um, for my daughter. Mm -hmm. What is it about? It's about interactive art. Oh. So my daughter's an artist. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, hon, I'm going to tell the story. <laughs> she was a young artist here at NC State, and she wanted to pay homage to a loom. A loom is something that weaves cloth. Mm -hmm. So there was an old factory to an art exhibit in, and she wanted to basically put a virtual loom where the loom stood, literally the same footprint. So she wanted a 19-foot by 6-foot thing that moves in the ceiling and moves threads. So she comes to me and says, I want to do that. So great, we sit down and do that. She has exactly the vision she wants, but she didn't have the engineering skills to do the electronics or the mechanics or the programming. So it required mechanical, electrical input programming. So rather than me build it for her, she wanted me to teach her how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so in teaching her, other artists around her came over and they were learning about motors and controllers and basic programming. Yeah. What I learned is, is the left brain and the right brain, right? The artists in the tip of the right brain don't have that same concepts that engineers have, that system thinking. Mm -hmm. And so the book is basically going to be how to do some simple things like power a motor, stop a motor, start a motor, mm -hmm. write a program. So that, in fact, one of the other art exhibits was some blocks with like a gray, a gray side, a black side, and a white side. And so it would take your picture with a camera and then rotate the blocks and give you sort of a pixelated picture of you. Again, the idea, the concept, amazing. Mm -hmm. Making it work, they need an engineer to come in. So few, yeah. you know, so it's electronics art, a few. That's one book. Another book I'm writing is How to Manage Wild Ducks. Mm -hmm. well, one of the hardest things you're going to find, and you're all going to be managers and leaders in your time, is you're going to surround yourself by really smart people. Yeah. You're really going to find type A personality. And I have classes full of them. Mm -hmm. And I love it. The problem is managing them. It's like herding cats. It's not easy to manage really bright people because they're all right. Every one of them is right and wants to be right. Anyone, every one of them is like someone in this room I will not mention. Yeah. But <laughs> they're like that. Imagine 10 of them in a room trying to get something done. Yes. Having that skill to be able to give them the time to talk, get their ideas appreciated. That's another one of the books we're working on. Then Mind Your P's and Q's, the political quotient we were talking about earlier off camera. Not politics like Washington, but politics like interpersonal politics yes. to add to IQ and EQ. And then the last one I've just started and I, I hope to ever finish these, is on um, the soft skills. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things we talk about in class, we talk about in individual conversations, is, is the amount of soft skills that mm -hmm. you need to really survive in the world. Collaboration, teamwork, communication. They're not just important in projects. They're important in any relationship. They're important in being a roommate, being a life partner. You need those soft skills to be successful. And so a lot of time we focus on the hard skills. We only have 16 weeks, so many hours, you can't get it all in. So it's the after hours off camera talks about soft skills, communication, yeah. teamwork. Um, I really want to drive that home, not just for your schooling, but for life. I mean, it's hard mm -hmm. being an active listener. It's not hard. When you're type A personality and you want to talk, being an active listener is really difficult. And you have to learn to do that. You have yeah. to learn to pause and let someone else have the time. If you go by my desk, you'll see all these props I used with people. Um, I have a little, used to have a talking stick, but now I have a cube with one, three, and five minutes on it. And so if I got 10 people all want to be heard, I give them the cube and you have one minute. And you have one minute, you have one minute. So when the cube beeps, they pass it on. Before it'd be all 10 people trying to talk at once because they're all right, they're all smart. And, and I would encourage you, please surround yourself with smart people. Yeah. Don't surround your 
yourself with people who are not going to tell you you're wrong. Yeah. Hire 10 people that are going to tell you you're wrong. And you can still, be, still go the other way, but at least they told you. Just make sure they know not to do it in public. Yeah. That's one of the things, I, one of the lessons I learned early in my career is not to point out to your boss when they're wrong in public. Do it in private. They're about to step on a landmine, and, and, and it's like, no, no, that's not true. That's not the time to do it. The time to do it is off, take a break, talk off camera, talk out of the meeting and say, look, you may not know, but a new piece of information came in you need to be aware of. Boom. But always be the person that tells your boss they're wrong. Yeah. Just do it properly. And as a boss, as a manager, as a leader, hire people that are going to tell you when you're wrong. Because you will be wrong. Yes. There's always someone smarter or more information than you have. So be prepared. And, and I just love everyone that I've ever managed. I really do. That energy I have now, I had that energy in private sector because I had people just like you working for me that were amazing at their job. That were just the last, one of the last few groups, I won't tell you which one. I found a group of people that were on an island isolated. No one wanted to work with them because they were all really smart, really driven, wanted to be heard. And so they sort of ended up in a group together. And I took over that group. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you're insane. You know, these are like the Wild West, right? But yeah. within a month, we found our pace, and there was nothing we couldn't do together, nothing we couldn't accomplish. They were amazing people that would do anything to get the work done and just worked hard, got it done, worked smart. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted the people that were on my island. It's like, well, wait a minute. They were there on the island before I came. All I did was help them see their potential. It's part of being a professor is coming here and helping you see your potential. It's not me. I'm not giving you anything you don't already have. I'm just exposing you. Yes. And that's the beauty in it is just seeing you shine, seeing you again. And then I suck that energy off you and do it again the next day and the next day. So it's uh, self-serving. I'm sorry. Being a, being a professor is self-serving for me because I get to enjoy you. And not just you three. There's... I think 204 students I interact with this year. I still have students come back from previous semesters. And uh, I love that even more. I'm getting some senior projects from students I had previous semesters. Because now they're successful. And now I can knock on their door and say, hey, remember when? That's so lovely. So I see some doors I'm knocking on in my not too near future for some <laughs> projects. So. Yeah. On a final note, what advice you want to give us? Again, I would say be brave. Don't be afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. Find a mentor, a manager, a leader that lets you fail and helps you learn from those failures. But most of all, enjoy it. The ride goes way too fast. It wasn't a long ago I was your age. It goes way too fast. And if you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. Yes. I've always had fun. You heard my story. Yes. You take a dozen stories about doing fun things, getting in trouble sometimes for doing fun things. It's okay. But you do it for the right reasons and you do it with a team. It brings you closer together and it helps you achieve great things. Yeah. And even if I'm not part of their successes now, I was part of the successes back then. So, and that's the same advice I'd give to you. Yeah. And again, find a mentor, find a partner in life. Don't go through this journey alone. It's a fun life. Have someone to share it with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Best much. Best of luck for to all of you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.